We confess in the creed as we just did, week after week, he ascended into heaven. The ascension of our Lord serves as a bridge between Easter and Pentecost, but it's really far more than a bridge. It is the coronation of Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord and our King. Now perhaps when we think of a coronation, what might come to mind is a high school coronation of a homecoming king and queen and their court. Though this is somewhat of a helpful image, it certainly pales in comparison to the coronation of Christ as king. And as Americans, we probably struggle to see the significance of a coronation. We don't have a monarch. We don't have a king or queen. The closest thing that we have to a coronation is an inauguration. And though thousands attend an inauguration of a president, it seems to fail in the realm of the pomp and the circumstance as a king or queen sits upon their throne and the crown is placed upon their head. In fact, as I thought about the coronation, the only images that kept coming to my mind were images that I have from movies. You may know this, I'm a big fan of the Lord of the Rings series. And so I love the books, I love the movies. If you don't watch Lord of the Rings, I encourage you to do so. I mean, it takes you about 11 hours to get through all the movies, all right? But in that last movie, there is a scene where the great enemy Sauron has been defeated, and all the people from far and wide gather at the great white city of Osgiliath, up in the upper court. And they all gather for the coronation of their king. King Aragon has the crown placed upon his head, and he turns and he faces the people, and everyone lets out a shout of joy and victory. It is an image for us to consider as we consider the ascension of our Lord as he ascended into heaven. Perhaps you have other images that come to mind when you think of a coronation. The ascension of our Lord, as he ascended into heaven, took place in Bethany, we are told. On the Mount of Olives, the disciples were all gathered around, and then Jesus blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he parted from them, was carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple blessing God. They returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. This has always struck me as a bit odd <laughs> because it seems hard to fathom that they worshipped him and rejoiced. It's been my experience in life that goodbyes are hardly a time for rejoicing. Coming from a blended family, I have had my fair share of goodbyes. I only got to see my older siblings a couple times a year, usually one time actually in the summer months. And we got to see them for about a month. And every time we went to the airport, it just ripped my heart out to have to say goodbye to my siblings yet again. Goodbyes are painful. Goodbye is like having a piece of you torn away. At least that's the way I hate people, right? I hate the lies. And yet the disciples here, as they are here in Bethany, were rejoicing and worshiping when Jesus left and ascended into heaven. It would seem that such an occasion would be a time to be rather downtrodden, because here Jesus, he had journeyed with them these last three years. They'd grown close to each other. They'd seen him die. They'd seen him rise. And now he was leaving. It would seem that they would feel abandoned if anything else. But this was no abandonment. This warranted no hard goodbye. The ascent. 
ascension of our Lord to be coronated as King of the Universe was a time for celebration, and it still is on this very day. As I said before, the ascension of our Lord as he ascended into heaven is more than just a bridge between Easter and Pentecost. It is a bridge between heaven and earth. As Jesus departed from this earth to take his rightful spot at the right hand of God the Father, he did so for us. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples back in John 14? He said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. So Jesus is up in heaven right now, and he's preparing a place for us. Just think of all the love and the care, the attention to detail, the great lengths that he is going to in order to make sure that everything is just right for our arrival. He can't wait to have all of us in heaven with him for all eternity. And he is making sure that our entrance into his house will be far beyond what we could ever ask for or imagine. But he knows we're still waiting. He knows we're still waiting for that day to come, and so there's much to the journey that yet remains. So scripture also says that Jesus Christ is the one who's at the right hand of God, and indeed is interceding for us. So picture that for a moment. From his throne, Jesus is praying for us. He is pleading for us. He is bringing our request to God the Father himself. And there's nothing more that the Father delights in than hearing the voice of his Son. And so this encourages us then to call upon Jesus' name, to pray to him, because Jesus is our advocate with the Father. And so as our advocate then, he exercises his authority and power for our benefit. Through the means of grace, through word, and through sacraments, Christ the King protects us from the evil one. Through the means of grace, through word, and through sacrament, Christ the King prepares us for his final return, giving us forgiveness, life, and salvation. Now, in our human minds, with our human reason and all, it doesn't make sense that words, water, bread, and wine all that. Protect us from the evil one. Prepare us for the final coming of Christ. To our minds, it would actually seem a little bit better if Jesus would have just stayed right here with us, here on earth. But his being on his throne in heaven in no way diminishes the impact that he has here on this earth. The ascension of our Lord as he ascended into heaven is by no means a retreat into heaven. He isn't waving the white flag here, but it is instead an advance of Christ's saving work here on earth. Not by our own reason or strength can we understand this to be true. In fact, all too often we tend to take God's gifts that he gives us in word and sacrament for granted. Failing to prioritize them in our busy lives. Which is why, just like the disciples who stood there looking up into heaven as Jesus ascended there, is that we need the help of the Spirit then to believe that the ascension of our Lord is no abandonment, but rather exactly what we need from our King. It is as Jesus told his disciples, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. This is why the disciples rejoiced and worshipped as they saw Jesus go up into heaven, as he opened their minds to the scriptures. They knew 
he was not abandoning them. He was sending them the helper, just as he had promised. He was sending them out to be his witnesses, to proclaim the good news of great joy that would be for all people. And all along the way, he would be there to help them, to support them, to strengthen them, and to equip them. And the same is true for each of us, as we are also called upon to be Christ's witnesses. With the same spirit given to the disciples, so too we are sent and we are clothed with power from on high. In the spirit given to us in our baptism, we are given all that is needed to share hope and teach Christ in the confidence of our King who sits upon his throne. Which then calls upon us to ask of ourselves, who is it in our lives that needs to hear this good news of great joy? Who is it in our lives that needs to hear that Jesus Christ is seated upon his throne for our benefit? Who is it? Is it a neighbor? Is it a friend? Is it a co-worker? Is it a family member? We are called upon, privileged, to witness to the fact that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Though his throne on earth was a cross and he was crowned with a crown of thorns, he is now enthroned and exalted in the halls of heaven. The great divide that existed between humanity and God has been ended. When Jesus ascended and he took his spot at the right hand of the Father, he declared that everything was now done. Sin, death, the devil, all done for. And this is the message that is placed upon our lips as we join with those disciples in worshiping and rejoicing. See, we have a God whose work of redemption for us is complete. We have a God who is ruling over the entire universe for us. We have a God who is preparing a place for us right now. We have a God who is interceding for us. And so, let us rejoice in our God, our ascended King. For this is why we gather here today. <laughs> Like those disciples who were continually in the temple, blessing God, so it is with us. Because this is where our strength comes for serving as his witnesses. This is where his word and sacrament are located for us. This is where Jesus is at, our ascended king. And we gather here to worship at the feet of our king, whose final reign is now at hand. And it won't be long, and we will soon see him descend from heaven with the voice of an archangel and the cry of command and the sound of the trumpet of God. It won't be long, and we will always be with our Lord. Praise be to Christ, our ascended King.